Good to see you. My name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here and part of our preaching team. And once again, welcome to Redemption Gateway. Uh, as Josh said a moment ago, this is a huge week for us. And so uh, one of the ways that we're trying to prepare uh, for just all that's going to happen this week is through prayer. And so after the last service tonight... Uh, at 7 o'clock, we will begin what will be 24 hours of prayer that will go all week. So we have different people and leaders scheduled to come and to lead uh, prayer meetings every hour on the hour, all night long, uh, all week long. And so we would love to have you join us for that. Maybe you've signed up to be part of it. Maybe you haven't signed up, but you just kind of have some space this week where you could come over for an hour, maybe even two. Uh, what we'd love you to do is just when you get here, if you come on campus, just come through these east doors over by this big ironwood tree, come in the lobby, and the kickoff of the prayer meeting will all be at, at room 100. And so uh, we'd love you to come by. If you, if you haven't signed up, pick one hour this week. Doesn't have to be at 2 a.m., but come some point and uh, dr just drop in and take an hour to pray for your own heart, to pray for your family, to pray for our community, and to pray for our church as we embark on this new journey. Uh, we're finishing the book of Philippians today, and in the, the passage we just read a moment ago is a verse that is very famous, especially to athletes. Philippians chapter 4.13 is one of the first verses I learned as a Christian baseball player, uh, and I wrote it all over my hat and all over my shoes and all over all sorts of things, just like a lot of people did. Here's what it says. It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Oh man, athletes love that verse, right? I read, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And you know how I interpreted that? I went, oh my goodness, this means that if I am full of faith, if I am like in a good place with God, I can somehow channel his strength and I can do all things through him who strengthened me, which means that I'm ready to go. And when that pitch comes, oh, here goes a 500 foot home run because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can't hit the ball 500 feet, but through Christ I can. Right, that's how I thought about it. And that's how a lot of athletes think about stuff. And so, like I said, we would take the, our, our ball caps and we'd take them off and on the, the brim, the, the underside of the brim, you'd write your name and maybe uh, for either for faithful reasons or superstitious reasons, you would write a verse on there. And so a lot of guys on their hats had Phil 413 written on their hat. And I remember one time when I was in high school, one of the assistant coaches, Coach Blesser, he came up to me and he said, hey, is something happening in Philadelphia <laughs> on April 13th? <laughs> like, or did something happen? Like, is that a famous date in history? Like, why are all, the, like, I see you have this on your hat. Like, why is Phil 413? Is something going on in Philadelphia on that date? Like, and I said, no, 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 no. That's a verse about how if you trust in Jesus, he'll let you do anything that you set your mind to. Now, I was wrong about that because that's not what Philippians 4.13 is about. We as athletes uh, horribly ripped that out of context. And uh, I saw that baseball players are not the only people who do it. Uh, here's some shoes of some athletes uh, who write it all over their shoes. You can see there uh, one athlete uh, in the NBA writes, I can do all things. Right, he leaves out the who through Christ who strengthens me. Either way, we're missing the point. And uh, today, among other things, we're going to see the true context of that verse and really try to understand its true meaning. As I said, we're wrapping up the book of Philippians. It's been a great summer study uh, for us. Uh, I would really encourage you, if you weren't with us last week, make sure you go online and you watch or listen to Seth's sermon from last week about anxiety. It's already, just in a week, the most watched and most shared sermon that we've ever done here. And so I'd make, I'd make sure you go watch it and share it. I think you'll be really encouraged and blessed by it uh, if you get a chance to do that. Um, just so you know, uh, next week we're going to talk about how Jesus is our treasure. The week after that, we're going to celebrate baptisms. And then the week after that, we're going to kick off a series that will take us all fall through the book of Exodus. So that's where we're headed. But as I said, today we're finishing Philippians. And we've commented along the way through this book that this is Paul writing this very close personal letter with these people that he clearly has deep affection for. And now here at the end of the book, we finally are kind of led into why they are so close. It turns out they have had more than a decade of partnership together in ministry. 
More than a decade of praying for one another. More than a decade of the Philippians financially supporting Paul and encouraging him and meeting his needs and praying for him. And so we're finally led into that in this last section of the book. And what this last section is, is really Paul saying thank you to them for their partnership. They have sent one of their leaders with a huge financial gift, and he's now writing this thank you note. And it's interesting, because when we write a thank you note, we put the thank you where? At the beginning. In uh, the tradition of the first century, they would often put the thank you part at the end. And so here we are at the end of the letter. Paul is saying, thank you. And so what I want to do is I want to just kind of walk through these verses, make sure we kind of understand them, understand the context, and then there's two particular examples that I think are really going to jump out for us. Now, as we do this, uh, just keep in mind how tricky it is to say thank you when people give you something really nice. I mean, of course, you want to say thank you, right? Because if you don't say thank you, then you're like ungrateful. But if you're like too profuse with your thanks it almost feels like you're just trying to get more of what they gave you. Like I remember a number of years ago, I was with a friend who uh, is very well off in a real high profile kind of job type thing, and we were in San Diego, and we were driving around, and we drove by Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And he said, have you ever eaten at Ruth's Chris? I said, no. And so we kept driving around, and at the end of the thing, I was taking him uh, somewhere, and I, I dropped him off, and he said, well, you know what? Tonight you should eat at Ruth's Chris. And he pulled out his wallet and pulled out 200 bucks. Said, you and Molly, why don't you go have a nice dinner? That's a pretty sweet gift, right? So like, what do you do there? Like, obviously you say thank you, right? Because that's an amazingly generous and spontaneous gift. But on the other hand, if it's like too much, does he start to think, hey man, that was just a one-time deal. I'm not like <laughs> gonna keep giving you meals to Ruth's Chris. Like, and, and so you see Paul, in the, as we walk through this, you see him kind of navigating that tension. On one hand, he really wants to, these people to know that he loves them and he's thankful for them. On the other hand, he's trying to help them see, I'm not in this for the gifts you give me. I'm in this because of the relationship and the friendship that we have. So let's walk through it. If you have your Bible, Philippians 4, beginning in verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Apparently the Philippians had been concerned about Paul, asking about Paul, wondering about him, but he's hundreds of miles away. They didn't feel like they had a way to get to him. They didn't feel like they had a way to help him. And so all they could do was kind of think about him and pray about him. But now they've finally had a chance to send one of their leaders who's going to come to him and who's brought him this gift. They've revived their concern in that way. Verse 11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So Paul's here going like, listen, I'm so thankful that you, that you expressed concern for me. I'm so thankful you gave me this gift. But just so you know, no, no, I'm not in this because I'm so needy and I'm just so desperate to have the stuff you give me. I've actually learned to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So listen, the context of Paul's comment in verse 13 that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him is not 500-foot home runs and half-court shots. He's saying, I can endure anything. I've been through great times. I've been through hard times. No matter what I face, I can endure it. God, not not because I'm strong. This isn't self-sufficiency. This is Christ's sufficiency. Christ is strong through me. And so I appreciate your gifts, but just so you know, Philippians, I'm not in this because you're so good to me, but thank you for being so good to me. Verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. This is a special relationship that the apostle Paul has with this church in Philippi in Macedonia. Paul says from the very beginning, they were the first European church that Paul planted. And so he starts this church, and the next place he goes, you can read in Acts 17, right after being in Philippi in Acts 16, he goes to Thessalonica. And Paul says, from the very beginning, from the very moment that I left you under persecution, you supported me, you encouraged me, you gave me financial resources to further 
the work of the mission of the gospel. That's a unique, special relationship. No one else did that for him, he says. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift. Right again, he's saying, I'm really, really thankful, but just so you know, I don't love you because of the money. I love you because of what the money represents. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I seek the way that God blesses you because of your generosity. I seek the way that God sees you because of how you've sacrificed so greatly for me, he says. Verse 18, I have received full payment and more. You've given me more than enough, he says. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Epaphroditus was this leader that was core and key in the Philippian church who they parted with for months to send this gift. He says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he sends them off with the grace of Jesus. So you get the whole context here is Paul just saying thank you. Thank you so much for your partnership. Thank you for your relationship. Thank you for how you've supported me. Two examples really stand out to me as we go through that. So I want to take some time and, and camp a little bit, see what we can learn from these two examples. The first example is the Philippians' generosity. The second is Paul's contentment. So I think that the Philippians are far more generous than we tend to be, and Paul is far more content than we are. So I think there's a lot to learn from here. Let's pray, and then we'll dig into that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the examples here in your word. God, your word gives us promises to claim and commands to obey and, and examples to follow. And so, God, we pray that you would give us soft hearts, that we might follow these examples, listen and learn from them, and be challenged to hear your voice and to obey what you say. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. There's three things we notice about the Philippians' generosity. The first is that it was long-term. This was a long-term relationship. This was a long-term commitment. This was not something that was born out of just one temporary need, but rather was born out of a love for Paul and a love for the gospel spreading through Paul. Look at verses 15 and 16 again. He says, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, in the beginning of my gospel work, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only, even in Thessalonica, right away, right out of the chute. You've been with me for years and years and years. This is a long-term thing. Probably scholars estimate that somewhere between at least 10 or 15 years have passed from when Paul first planted the gospel and then a church in Philippi to now. And they're still sending him gifts. They're still supporting his ministry. They're still giving him financial resources so that he can devote time and energy to preaching the gospel and training leaders and influencing the church. They're still doing that. It's a long-term commitment. It's become a way of life for the Philippians. There's no indication that they're like, you know what, it's been long enough now. Tell Paul to get a job. By the way, Paul did get a job. Oftentimes, he worked as a tent maker, making animal skins into tents and using that money to be able to support his ministry. So he did that. There's also no indication that they go, you know what, as we've been kind of following correspondence with Paul, he seems really content, like he doesn't have any needs anymore. God's given him everything he needs. We can just step back. No, they keep engaging in this long-term commitment. Some people have described the difference between 3S giving, which is very common for us as Americans, 3S giving and 3P giving, which is what the scriptures call us to and which is what I think you see here exemplified in the Philippians. 3P or 3S versus 3P giving. As we go through this, I just would be curious for you to just ask yourself, which do I tend to land more on? Am I more of a 3S giver or am I more of a 3P giver? The 3S givers are those who give sporadically, spontaneously, and sparingly. This is how a lot of us as Americans tend to do. We, we give sporadically. It's occasional. It's not regular. It's not systematized. It's not organized. It's just every now and then I give something to the church or I give something to a missionary or I give something to a cause. It's sporadic. It's also spontaneous. 
right? It's, you're at the checkout line at Safeway and they say, would you like to buy a shamrock for a dollar? Well, yes, I would, right? You go to Firehouse and they go, would you like to round up to donate to the fire? Fu-? Yes, I would. And you I'd go, I'm so generous. Now listen, by all means, say yes to those things. But a 3S giver is, is kind of someone who only gives in those situations. Spontaneously, you hear a need about a child in another part of the world and you are gripped by it and you are moved by it and it is emotional and so you go, I'm gonna give to that. Great, do it, do it a lot. But if that's the extent of your giving, it's just you have to be seduced by a really well-made video You're not actually a generous person. You're just a sporadic, spontaneous giver. 3S givers also give sparingly. Uh, One person is called these God tippers. I kind of give God a tip every now and then. Yeah, that was was nice. Uh, Here's a tip. It's sparingly. It's not uh, thought out. It's not planned. It's not very much. It's just a little bit here and there. That's 3S giving. That's very different than what we see here with the Philippians. With them, we see more of what you could call a 3P approach to giving. It's uh, priority, it's percentage, it's progressive. It's priority. This is something that they thought was important. It's been so important that now, maybe coming on 15 years, they've continued to give. It's percentage. Now, we don't know the exact percentage of giving that they're doing, but clearly they're giving a huge percentage of their income, not just sort of little throwaway bits, Um, These are big gifts that they're sending to Paul, able to support him probably for many months, maybe even a year or more at a time, their percentage, and they're progressive, meaning they're increasingly generous, right? They're so generous that now, 15 years later, they're parting with one of their own leaders for many months at a time in order for him to have this. So a a progressive giver is someone who says, you know what, I'm going to be intentional as a priority. I'm going to give a percentage of, let's say I'm going to try to give 5% this year. But you know what, next year I'm trying to get to six. And then I want to get to seven. And then I want to get to eight. And I want to just progressively try to get to a point. Some people have even done this where they say, you know what, my goal is to eventually become a reverse tither. Where I give away 90% and live on 10. That's generous. That's the kind of mentality you see here with the Philippians. It was a long-term, intentional kind of generosity. The other thing you see is that it was high cost. It was high cost. Look at verse 18. He says, I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Now, just, just think for a moment. The Philippians have given a gift that is so big that it requires one of the very most trustworthy leaders in their church to take it to Paul. So this is a costly gift. We don't know exactly the form it took, but this was something that that clearly would have cost them a lot in terms of the actual money that they gave. It also would have been an incredibly costly gift in terms of giving up a leader for that long. Like like you guys, you you know Josh Watt, who was just up here a moment ago, leads our next-gen ministry and our high school ministry. He's a great leader. He loves people. He's an incredible shepherd. Like, I don't know about you, I wouldn't want to just like send him away for six months to take some money to some people in Turkey, right? We, do, we support ministry in Turkey. I'm really glad that we can just like, through electronics, send it to them. <laughs> there it goes. Did you get it? Got it, right? It's super easy. That's not how it worked, right? What if we had to part with one of our very best leaders, say, hey, you know what, students? Hey, for the next year, you really just are gonna be without your high school pastor because it's so important to us that we support this gospel spreading across the world that we're sending him with a huge bag of cash to Turkey. That's a high cost kind of gift, isn't it? Look at the way that the Philippians were, were high cost, sacrificial givers. You see it actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In that chapter, Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's using the Philippians who are in Macedonia. He's using them as an example of really sacrificial giving. He says this We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. That's Philippi. For in a severe test of affliction, what, what was the test of affliction? We don't know. Was it a drought? Maybe. Was it a famine? 
Perhaps. What is it? Economic downturn? Maybe. Was it spiritual attack? We don't know. But the Macedonian church, the Philippians, had experienced a severe test of affliction. What, what happened as a result of that? He said, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy. Whoa. Wait, wait, wait. So they're in a severe test of affliction, but they have an abundance of joy. What does that mean? Well, it means this. <laughs> they're going... We were dead in our sins. Now we're alive in God through Christ. We were forgiven. We were cleansed. We were clinging to this kind of dead religion that couldn't get us anywhere. And now we have hope. We have life. Not just right now, but we have hope that forever we will be with Jesus in a renewed creation. Wow! That's abundance of joy. So they're in this affliction with abundance of joy. And what else? And their extreme poverty. Huh. So they've got a really difficult time, difficult circumstances. What do you do in difficult circumstances? What do we do when things get really tough? We tend to go, I gotta button the hatches, I gotta focus on me, I gotta focus on my family. Things are really difficult. But the Philippians weren't like us, apparently, because they had an abundance of joy and extreme poverty, and look at where it led. It has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. This is how sacrificial giving works, according to the model and the example of the Philippian church. Extreme affliction, abundance of joy, Extreme poverty leads to a wealth of generosity. Get this. God does not measure generosity by how much you give, but by how sacrificially and how joyfully you give it. So you may be someone that says, I don't have very much to give. I don't feel like I can make much of a difference in the world with the gospel locally or around the world. My little gift isn't going to do anything. But God sees it. And God says, that's Generous. Look at how eager they were to be part of this. It says, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. When was the last time you begged an organization, a missionary, a church? Oh, I have not had this meeting yet. I'm new I'm new to Redemption Gateway. I'm begging you, please let me give. I see the impact you're having in this community. Please, I I know you probably won't let me, but please let me give. (laughs) I've never had that meeting. I've never never begged someone else. Hey, can can I please, can I just please, 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 pretty please, can I give to you? Never had that. Why would they have had to do that? Probably because their situation was so bad that other people were going, you can't afford to give us anything. No, sit this one out. And they said, we will not. That's generosity, isn't it? That should rattle us. That should shake us. Oh man, what would it look like if the church was that generous? The people of God were that open-handed with the resources God had given us. How are they able to do that? Well, the third thing we see about their generosity is that it's supplied by God. They're able to be generous because they know, like Paul knows, that God will supply every need of theirs according to his riches and glory in Christ. See, we struggle to be generous because we struggle to believe that if we're generous, God will provide what we need. We think, I see all these bills I have to pay. I see all these expenses I have. I see all these forthcoming things. All right, I just found out last week my daughter's getting braces, and we've saved some money for that. We have not saved enough money for that. All right, and, and, and just like you, you have all kinds of like, more things coming at you than you could ever imagine. And our tendency is to go, well, gosh, I, if I give away this money, I'm not going to have it for all this other stuff that I need to have it for or that I want to have it for. I don't trust that God will give me what I need. I was talking with a young guy just last week who I had challenged a few months ago. I said, listen, maybe the reason it's always been hard to trust God with your giving is because you've never trusted God with your giving. Go for it. Try it. He came back to me this week. He said, 
I'm so thankful you challenged me in that. He said, I've seen God provide in a number of ways that I never would have expected. We don't trust that God will give us what we need, but the reality is the way it works for God is the more we pour out, the more he keeps giving us to keep pouring out. The more that we give away, the more he supplies us to give away. Right? It works a lot like a nursing mother. Some of you are like, where's he going with this? I have not nursed any children, but I have watched a woman nurse four of them. And I know that every situation is a little bit different, but, but, but generally the way it works is that as a mom keeps nursing her children, she keeps being supplied with milk. Again, it doesn't always work like that, but generally speaking, that's true. Keep feeding the child, keep having milk to feed the child. All right? Some of you, you, you did this like far beyond where most people did. Your family got very uncomfortable. But you were like, no, I have good reasons why I'm doing this. And there's health and there's, there's lots of things, right? But you know that like you can go way beyond, in some cases you can go way beyond toddler years and keep nursing if you keep giving away. This is how it works. God, get, get this, God feeds and nourishes his church and his gospel and his world through the giving away of resources by his people. That's how he does it. And we keep giving it away and he keeps supplying it and we keep giving it away and he keeps supplying it. This is not we give it away so that he can give it to us and then we hoard it. That's prosperity teaching. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying you give and you go, wow, God gave me more to give. And you just keep going. That's the example of the Philippians. It's remarkable, isn't it? See, I, th I think a lot of us who, who feel stuck in our faith, maybe one of the things we haven't considered that might actually kind of break us out of the kind of stuck place we are is that maybe one of the ways God might break us out of that is actually through more intentional, generous giving. Because Jesus said where our treasure is, our heart follows. So just consider that. That might be something you've overlooked as a way to bump up your spiritual growth is to trust him more with your generosity. So that's the Philippians' generosity. The second thing that I know we don't have, I know I don't have, is Paul's contentment. Paul's contentment. The Philippians are far more generous than we tend to be, and Paul is far more content than we are. Look at how comprehensive this is in verse 11 and 12. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, he says, for I have learned in whatever situation, see how comprehensive that is? In any situation at all, to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. Again, it's comprehensive. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. This is a comprehensive approach to contentment. And just think for a moment about this word content. What does that word mean? Well, that word means satisfied. It means I have enough. Right, the way I think about this is like, there's that moment on Thanksgiving where you've been, I mean, you haven't eaten much all day, right? So you've been kind of saving up and you have your sweatpants on so that you're ready, right? Or at least like a, you know, expandable belt. And, and you eat and you get to that point where you're like, ah, oh, this feels really good. I'm content. And then you keep eating, right? And you're like in pain and you like want to throw up and at the end you're like, I'm never eating again, right? That's how, but that moment that you have like where it's like, oh, I'm not still hungry and I'm not painfully full. I'm full, I'm content, I'm satisfied. That's what Paul's saying. He's learned, he has. He's learned to be content. Now get this, this is not detachment where you say, I have no desires, I have no interests, I have no things that I need. And, and, and you detach as though you don't have desires and needs. No, Paul says, I have desires and needs, but I've figured out through Christ how to be happy with whatever gets met. It's a comprehensive thing. Whatever situation, in any and every circumstance, what about you? What about me? Could you say that you're content, satisfied? I've got enough in any and every Circumstance? I can't. Which is why the second thing we see about Paul's contentment here is that it's elusive. 
It's elusive. Look at how he describes it in verse 12. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. The secret. In other words, this contentment is so hard to have. It's such a rare thing to have in your life. It's a secret. Most people don't have it. Most people miss it. Now listen, I stand before you today and I don't have the secret. I haven't reached this. Paul has. I think it's possible. You can actually get there. I, I'm not yet there. My guess is most of you aren't either. Which is why we keep thinking, oh, in this new season of life, I'll be content. When my kids get to that age and it's not so crazy, then I'll be content. When my project at work finishes and then I get this promotion, then I'll have enough. When the people in my life finally thank me for all that I've done for them, then I'll be content. Right? We always have a, if this, then I'll be content. I remember sitting watching my youngest child, Hank, in the bathtub a year or so ago. He was a little baby, just could sit up. And he's sitting in the bathtub, and he's watching the water pour out of the, out of the thing. And he's going like this. And he, I'm watching him. He's just baffled. He's absolutely baffled because he's going, I, I can't grab it. I can't grab it. That's how we are trying to grab contentment. Wow. Oh, this is the time. Oh, it's gone. This is the time. It's gone. I don't know about you, but aren't you frustrated by how, uh, just how discontent you are? I am. I have an amazing life. I, I, I think it's interesting. Like a lot of us have, we, we have examples of people who have nothing and are content, right? If you've ever gone to a developing country on a mission trip, if you ever get the chance to go to one of our Juarez spring break or fall break trips, I guarantee what you'll say when you come back is, it's amazing that people have nothing, but they have so much joy. How many times have you heard that? What I wonder is, can you have joy and contentment when you have abundance? Can you have contentment? You've got two cars. Some of you, every, every kid in your house has their own room. You, you are dizzied by how many options you have of what to watch on TV. You can't figure out which TV in your house to watch it on. You have a thing in your pocket that 20 years ago would have been the greatest computer anyone has ever seen, but the camera's not as good as the new one. And it's just around and around and around we go, grasping, grabbing, will it be enough? And it isn't. Jeremiah 2.13 the Lord says this, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is what we do. God is this fountain of living water, this fountain of satisfaction and joy and enough. And we go, eh, don't want it, God. I'm busy digging a cistern here in the mud because I'm gonna collect some rainwater and drink that. And Jesus comes to us and says, I want to be the fountain of living water for you. This is what he tells the Samaritan woman. Whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give, out of him will, throw, will flow fountains of living water. How, how do we get this elusive secret thing? Get this, it's not something we work for. It's something we find through Christ. Through relationship with Christ. Look at what it says in verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
Where do we find this contentment? In him. So listen, we will only find this to the degree that we are pushing into relationship, closeness with Jesus, so that we are close to the source of the fountain of living waters. It was very common, actually, in Paul's day. There were a bunch of Stoic philosophers who said, you know what, you can have contentment, you just need to be self-sufficient. You can have it by looking at yourself, which is actually quite a bit how we think about it today. I I, just, I I don't know what I Googled, something like... uh, Statements of affirmation to say to yourself every day. I got a long list. Look at some of what I came up with or what I found. I have all the power I need. I will be my own best advocate. I have the strength to succeed. I am the author of my own destiny. I will triumph over all challenges. I believe in myself. This is... (laughs) This is what we think. If I say these things every day, then I will sort of send out the vibes of that into the universe and it will come back to me. This is how non-Christians think. This is how Christians think. You know what? I need to be content. I need to be strong. I need to dig deep and find it in me. This is not self-sufficiency. This is Christ-sufficiency. And we're so easily drawn to say, yeah, I can do it. I have all the strength to succeed. Until you don't. I will triumph over all challenges. Until you die. I will be my own best advocate. Until you stand before a holy God and have to give account for your life. Think about how Paul sees this so differently. This isn't self-sufficiency. This isn't these affirmations that I'm just gonna say till I believe them. This is him looking to Christ. Look at Philippians 1, what he said. It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What is he focused on? Christ. Philippians 3. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. 2 Corinthians 12. Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. Do you see that word? I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You will not find contentment by digging deep and affirming your own strength. You will only find it by looking outside of yourself to Jesus Christ. (laughs) This is not a verse, verse 13, about achieving or about succeeding. It's about being able to endure life in a broken world where things do not go your way and to still find an iridescent joy that shines in the darkness. Nothing's happening, I'm sorry to inform you, in Philadelphia on April 13th. And this verse won't help you hit 500 foot home runs or hit half court shots. But as you push into Christ, you may just find that the elusive secret of contentment is actually possible and that he is enough. In just a moment, we're gonna go to the communion table, hungry, thirsty, asking him to satisfy us and to fill us. So even if you find yourself in a place right now where you are not content, use this as a chance to admit that to him And to ask him to be enough. Let's pray and then Josh will come and lead our time of response. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. And thank you even more for Jesus, the one who satisfied him. The one who points to a hope that's beyond ourselves. 
God, help us to forsake the tendency we have to just look within and be self-sufficient. Rather, help us to be Christ-sufficient. Help us to look to him and would you shine through us, even in our weakness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Luke.